Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar from the adoption team. Today we're going to talk about the LPWA landscape. I'm going to explain what LPWA means and uh, the technologies uh, behind it. So you have Sigfox, LoRa, NBIoT, and there are other names also, but these are the three main ones. So we're going to do a focus on these three. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will be free to ask me questions that I will answer. And um, I will start first uh, uh, with uh, the explaining the difference between Sigfox and LoRa. I will make a small break and allow you to ask uh, two questions, and then I will keep the rest of the questions for the end. So, LPWA means low power wide area. This is a, a new category of technology technologies that have been created to answer to a specific need. I will come back on that. Low power because this is uh, the power consumption of uh, the devices um, for, for the IoT and wide area because this is about long range communication. So basically Sigfox has created this new category uh, that is now called LPWA. Uh, this is a new type of network uh, purposely built uh, for the IoT. Uh, you see that there are other uh, radio technologies you are aware of, especially uh, in the short range. So you have Bluetooth uh, that you you all have on your on your phone, and then if you if you are a little bit techy and have uh, smart home devices, you may have devices that are using uh, Zigbee or Z-Wave protocols. Um, everyone also uh, knows Wi-Fi. Um, so this is about private area network, like, like we call it. And then there is local area network, which Wi-Fi is also part of. You also have protocols like MBUS that is used a lot for uh, mesh networks. You probably have heard of MBUS uh, related to um, connected meters, like, like water meters or electricity meters. And then you see uh, the first player we're going to talk about, LoRa Semtech. So LoRa is the, the protocol and the alliance uh, behind the technology, and Semtech uh, is the company that owns uh, the technology. Uh, and, and, and I will explain in detail uh, why both are linked to, to each other. So the origin of LoRa is from the local area network and inspired by what Sigfox has been doing um, as a public IoT network, they also moved to that model. So that's why you see LoRa twice um, on this slide. Then um, you have cellular protocols. Uh, you know 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, 4G meaning uh, LTE, and, and standards have evolved uh, to target more and more IoT use cases. Uh, you have a, a high-end protocol called LTEM and a lower end one called NBIoT that is uh, somehow but not fully uh, competing with, with LoRa and Sigfox. And here is a, a quick definition of uh, low power wide area networks, what, what it does and what it does not do. Um, LPW have been created for uh, supporting a high density of objects, meaning uh, we are creating a high capacity network. Uh, the goal also is to reduce the cost of the hardware. You are probably aware that uh, a 4G module uh, costs around $35. So in your smartphone, you all have a 4G module that costs between $35 and $40. And that is not suitable uh, for the Internet of Things, not, not, the, not the lower end at least. Then uh, it's meant also to have a reduced connectivity cost meaning that subscription fees are very low. We are talking about objects that are communicating uh, very few times in a day, so uh, we want to pay as less as possible. And it comes with some downsides. The first one is low data rates, so these are not the most responsive technologies. They are not responsive like your, your mobile phone, and, and therefore the, the latency is constrained. It can take up to multiple seconds uh, to receive a message uh, on, on the back end. 
So here is a quick summary of how it differs, uh, how LPWA or LP1 differs to uh, the cellular network and to the local area networks. Uh, so first, the range of the base stations is much uh, longer than cellu the cellular network. So that is the, the first advantage, meaning that to cover a country, you will need less base stations with LPWA that you need with cellular. So that is the first benefit. And that's why uh, you see that you, you will pay less connectivity subscription, subscription. It's because the network is less expensive to deploy. The second benefit is the power consumption that is highly reduced. This is because uh, IoT objects using L LPWA are mostly as asleep and they just wake up to send their data value and go back to sleep. The bandwidth uh, consumption is also very low, so we are operating on very few uh, kilohertz. Uh, this, is, this is because mostly LPWA technologies are using the public spectrum, and this is a, a very limited space, so we have to be efficient in, in that limited uh, bandwidth. Uh, next, the radio chipset cost is very low, um, so I was saying earlier that a 4G module costs between $35 and, and $40. Uh, in comparison, uh, Sigfox, uh, a Sigfox module can cost uh, uh, around $2. Then the, the subscription cost, as we said, is, is much lower. Uh, what we say at Sigfox is that usually it starts from $1 per year to uh, $1 per month. And then depending on the volume, depending on the number of messages, uh, it varies between these, these two values. Um, we said earlier that since the range is longer, the number of base stations is, is lower. Um, and the inconvenient of this technology, if there is one, is the latency. So it can take up to multiple seconds to send a message. This is because to achieve a long range, you need very low data rates. And very low data rates means that the data takes a longer time uh, to go through the network. Okay. So LPWA is set to represent between 20 and 25% of the IoT market by 2025. Uh, this, this is coming from uh, Makina Research, um, which has uh, later been acquired by Gartner. So you see, you see the numbers that are uh, a little bit outdated, but um, the percentage is still the same. LPWA is going to be a big player uh, in the IoT landscape. You have all the short range applications using Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and probably Zigbee, while uh, the pro protocol is not that popular anymore. Then um, you can see that LPWA is going to be bigger than cellular because cellular is very expensive. You have a, a, a final category with uh, probably uh, satellite connectivity and other type of connectivities that, uh, that fall into others. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start first with the comparison between Sigfox and LoRa. Um, I decide to compare these two at first because uh, these are the two uh, main technologies using the unlicensed spectrum. And actually, LoRa, uh, there are, we are talking about uh, two kinds of, of uh, networks. You have the LoRa network, which is uh, a private one, and then you have LoRa1 networks, uh, which are the public ones deployed by uh, mobile operators. Okay. So here is the way it works. Uh, depending on the distance between the device and the base station, uh, the bit rate differs. So you see that as you get close to the base station, the bit rate is high, multiple kilobit per second. And as you get far from the base station, uh, the bit rate is lower, uh, down to 290 bit per second. If, if it takes longer to send a message, it means that the energy consumption of the object is higher. So you see, as you get further from the base station, the energy consumption uh, goes up. In comparison, Sigfox would be a straight line. So 
depending on where you are in the world, uh, the data rate of Sigfox can be uh, 100 bit per second in Europe, Middle East, Africa, or anywhere else in the world, it will be 600 bit per second. And the energy consumption will, will be uh, lower than the one of LoRa, um, and it will be a straight line. Okay. The second difference between LoRa and Sigfox is the modulation approach uh, for, for using the, 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 the unlicensed spectrum. Uh, Sigfox has gone with ultra narrow band. So you see an ultra, an ultra narrow band signal uh, looks like this. You see, a, 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 it looks like a big dot. Well, here it's, it's a little bit spread, but uh, it looks like a big dot. A big dot. Um, the benefit of that is having a higher capacity of objects. So you see that we can have uh, hundreds of objects communicating at the same time um, on the network in, in the same area. And the, the second benefit, it, it's a higher resistance to noise. Okay, it's like a, a laser uh, pointing to somewhere. You, you can distinguish it very, very easily from the noise. So these are the two main benefits of uh, ultra band modulation. On the other side, LoRa went with spread spectrum. And uh, spread spectrum is less uh, efficient uh, regarding capacity. So you see that you can have less concurrent messages, so less messages at the same time. But uh, the benefit of uh, spread spectrum would be a lower susceptibility to multipath fading. In other words, um, in, a, in an urban uh, environment, it's less affected by reflections on buildings. So LoRa is a great technology for private networks, but uh, it has difficulties with public networks. And here is a simulation by a professor uh, based in Belgium um, that simulated uh, concurrent messages on the Sigfox network and then on the LoRa network with a single base station. So you see uh, the number of base station of, of messages uh, at, at the bottom. And uh, on the vertical axis, you see the number of collisions. So with Sigfox, uh, as more and more uh, devices are uh, communicating concurrently, you have collisions between messages. Yeah, because uh, basically the, the object doesn't register to the network. It just sends a message without knowing if the channel is free or not. So sometimes you have collision and the more objects communicating at the same time, the higher the probability of collision. But you probably have seen uh, in the previous webinar explaining our protocol that we have uh, repetitions of, of Sigfox frames. So if you, you, you see that these are the number of collisions, but actually the, the number of messages lost is this uh, dotted line at the bottom. And you see that we lose nearly almost uh, nearly uh, no message. So for 1000 devices communicating at the same time, you will probably have uh, 0, 0.0 something percent uh, uh, of messages lost. And that's really impressive. On the opposite side, you see that the LoRa network is quickly saturated as you are uh, sending messages uh, concurrently. So you see like for maybe 20 devices uh, communicating within the same minute, you already have 80% loss. 80% loss of packets uh, and, and uh, lower for the, the message, uh, message loss. But you, you see that the capacity uh, is not the same and, and you've seen it visually from, from the previous slide. Another difference between Sigfox and, and LoRa, it's that both are proprietary technologies, but at different steps of the value chain. Sigfox is proprietary on the connectivity side. Sigfox is the only provider of base stations, okay? So there is no Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei uh, building uh, base stations. Uh, it's only Sigfox. And we have exclusive agreements with operators in countries. There is a single operator in each country. 
So not everyone can uh, purchase base stations and operate the Sigfox network. Yeah. And it's, it's only for, for public ones. On the chip side, um, the library is license free. So we are not uh, asking any, any, any fees um, to the semiconductor companies. And it's open uh, on that side of the value chain. So we have multiple uh, chip vendors. On the opposite side, um, uh, Laura is proprietary on the chip side. So Semtech is the owner of the technology. It's the, sing it's the only chip vendor. However, it's open on the connectivity side. So you have multiple uh, base station vendors and anyone is free to purchase them and operate a network. So there are pros and cons to, to both approach. Um, Sigfox uh, made a, a public network um, that, that is supposed to be uh, seamless. So you see that we have the same type of base stations in every country. Uh, you can roam with your device. You will have the same uh, quality of service. Um, however, on Laura's side, you have multiple uh, gateway or base station vendors. You can have uh, multiple operators within the same country or within the same area. And that adds to the, the collision, collision issue I, I was mentioning before. And you can also have multiple uh, IT solution uh, vendors. Okay, so you have a fragmented service delivery. And the objective of LoRa is the silicon cell. So Semtech is trying to sell as, as more chipset as possible. Um, and uh, it, can, it can go through uh, private networks or public ones. Wh whatever is good, um, it, wh whatever is good for them, um, they, they will push. The benefit of Sigfox is to have only one subscription to connect the world. So you, you make a contract with your local operator and then your devices are able to roam uh, on the network at no extra fee. However, with uh, LoRa One. Uh, yet, uh, it's complicated to roam, and so far there, there have been only uh, a few uh, roaming agreements between the operators. So there are some compatibility issues. The Alliance has been working on, on this, on the roaming issue. Um, I think uh, they, are, they are close uh, to solve partly the problem, but yet anyone who's trying to do uh, multi-country use cases is coming to Sigfox. This is a, a small recap of the two technologies. So first you have the, the sensibi sensitivity of the base stations. Basically it means the, the range of, of a cell. And, and the one of Sigfox is a slightly bigger of the one of LoRa, uh, but the, the impact is very low. The, the, the capacity is what really matters for a public network. So ours is, is in the million of objects uh, while LoRa is quickly limited to a, a few thousands. We have a very good resilience to in interferences um, and, and LoRa has a poor resistance of, of, uh, to interferences due to its sp spread spectrum modulation. The cost of a module starts at $2 for a Sigfox. Last I checked, it was around $5 for LoRa. Uh, apologies if it's slightly lower today, but there are some limitations to, uh, to the price uh, it can reach because of the hardware requirements for, for modulating such uh, signal. Then uh, power consumption um, is slightly lower uh, for Sigfox. So I, I put uh, low for Sigfox and, and medium for LoRa. Uh, because you see there, there is plenty of collisions, um, you, you may have to repeat, uh, retransmit the message multiple times. Also, what I didn't say at the beginning is that um, the, the object has, has to register to the, to the network. About security, it's pretty much the same. Uh, AES uh, 128 for the encryption. Um, the downlink is device triggered on both sides and be aware that because we, we often read online that Sigfox doesn't support downlinks, uh, no, we do. And, and for both sides, it's device triggered and we are both limited in how many uh, downlink messages uh, we can have because there is a, a duty cycle regulation. We are, we are constrained on how much we can use the public spectrum 
So both protocols uh, cannot acknowledge every message. Uh, the data rate, I've mentioned it, 100 bit per second uh, to, to 600 bit per second, depending on the region. For LoRa, it's, it depends on how far from the base station you are, which spreading factor uh, you will use. Uh, the message side size um, is up to 12 bytes for Sigfox. It's flexible from 0 to 12. And uh, for LoRa, it's up to 50 bytes. So uh, th that is the first um, advantage of, of LoRa. If you need bigger uh, messages, um, that's, that's one of their advantage. And the second one is the daily traffic per device. Also, um, you can send more data uh, through LoRa. But again, it depends on which data rate you are sending at. So you have a, a duty cycle regulation that says you can use the spectrum 1% of the time. And depending on the data rate, um, you will have an impact on, on the traffic uh, you, can, you can use. And I, I will uh, finish on, on LoRa with the, the merits of each technology. So Sigfox, we've said uh, very low cost, uh, both on the module side, on the, on the uh, connectivity side, as well as the total cost of ownership. Uh, it's a global network. So uh, for any, any use case that requires uh, uh, multi-country coverage, um, this is a big selling point of Sigfox. Uh, the power consumption is low, as well as predictable because as I said, the data rate is never changing. So you can predict exactly uh, when you will have to replace the battery. Uh, Anti-jamming properties uh, is at the advantage of Sigfox. This is due to its uh, res resilience to interferences. Um, out of the box co connectivity, it's plug and play. If you have a subscription on the network, uh, when, when we recognize the ID of the object, we, knows, we, we know that we can uh, send the message through. And last, um, the service level agreement. Uh, it means that we are guaranteeing uh, the quality of service uh, while we are operating on the public band. So Sigfox is great uh, for um, any kind of application that requires a nationwide network, uh, agriculture, metering, uh, supply chain and logistics is gonna be the, the biggest vertical for Sigfox. Uh, that's that's one of the only uh, LPWA technology that is uh, a great fit uh, for that vertical, but it can target also others. Uh, LoRa is uh, low cost. Uh, we we can't deny that. The payload, the the size of the message is larger than the than the one of Sigfox. Um, it has a higher data rate, especially in short range. And also, you have the possibility to purchase your own base station and create your own private network. So uh, what we're seeing as successful applications for LoRa are uh, smart city uh, initiatives when the city wants to own and operate its network, uh, smart building uh, kind of use cases, as well as utilities, which means also uh, water and gas meters. So there are, there are some applications uh, where Sigfox and LoRa are competing, but uh, you see that there are some others uh, where uh, one technology is a better fit than, than the other. And I, I can pause here and take one or two questions if, if you have any. Uh, we don't have any question yet, Maxim. Uh, I'm not sure the attendees understood that they were able to uh, ask questions during the session. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, but feel free to ask them right now. Okay. If, if there's no question coming quickly, then I, I will uh, continue and, and we, we will take them uh, at the end. Don't hesitate to log anything you have in mind. Um, you can put in the chat window or in the, the, the Q&A uh, section your, your questions and, and we will address all of them at the end. Yeah, just to answer uh, Elliot, uh, we meet the beginning of the session. Uh, yeah, we will be able to share the slides afterwards. And anyway, the whole session is recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. And Angel, I saw your question as well, but as it's more generic, uh, we'll address it uh, over email. Thank you. Go ahead, Maxim. All right, so now let's talk about NBIoT. 
NBIoT is often often described as LPWA on steroids. It's a, it's a much higher end uh, protocol, and um, and part of, of 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 the reasons for for that is that it uses the license spectrum. So there is no uh, nearly no uh, limitation. So here's a comparison map of um, all the the the, the the standards, the cellular standards uh, for the IoT. So we had LTE Cat1. Uh, you see the data rate is above uh, one Mbps, and and the the coverage um, is quite is quite low compared to uh, to other IoT protocols. Ba basically, the coverage means uh, how big uh, one cell is, and the the more uh, cells you you need. The more expensive the network, so that that's why uh, this this criteria is critical, but uh, it does not do everything. And and usually a cellular base station is cost above um, ten thousand dollars, so uh, it has an impact on the on the connectivity subscription the the mobile operator is able to offer. So then you had uh, the LTEM uh, standard that, that came in. Um, the, the data rate is up to 375 uh, kilobit per second. So you see uh, it's faster data rate than Sigfox. Uh, it offers full mobility, and this one is important. I will, I will come back on this, as well as uh, voice over LTE um, support. And then you have a, a lower end uh, standard for the IoT called NB-IoT. Uh, it's meant to be a lower cost, to use uh, lower, lower cost uh, modules uh, to consume less power than LTEM and to be uh, more delay tolerant. So here the message can take up to multiple seconds to, to go through the network, uh, similarly to Sigfox. Uh, and Sigfox, uh, it's ultra low cost, ultra low, low power, and, and also delay tolerant. So you see that we are addressing a, 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 different, uh, a different market. So just a, a quick recap on the, on the protocol and to, just to show you uh, the innovation that, that is brought by Sigfox. We have built uh, a protocol that avoids uh, network synchronization. So when the device communicates, it does not know if the channel is free or not. And it's possible that one of the one of the frames, one of the replica will collide with another one, but we've built um, a probability uh, system uh, ensuring that at least one of them uh, will succeed. And we we'll keep monitoring the network for uh, knowing when we will have to densify the network and, and maintain our very high quality of service. So that's how we proceed, and we do not need any acknowledgement message uh, to ensure this high quality of service. However, NBIoT is is working the same way that uh, previous cellular protocols were working. So you still have a synchronization uh, and an access um, part. Then you 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 have the access request, the access grant, and then you can finally transmit the data. Every every message is acknowledged, and if it's not received, then uh, the transmission uh, is is done again. So you see that uh, if you look at the specifications of of NBIoT, you can have up to two thousand uh, retransmissions, and that is very high power consuming. So Sigfox and NBIoT are not uh, really competing. They are, they are complementary, I would say. Uh, Sigfox is message-based, is very low cost, uh, consumes very low power, is, is very simple to, to, to use, and has a global reach. Um, while NBIoT inherits uh, from the, the hurdles of, of cellular protocols, you still have the roaming barrier, meaning that uh, if your object needs to move between countries, you will have uh, some roaming fees. So you cannot predict uh, how much it will cost you. Um, you still have ex expensive uh, intellectual property rights. 
the technology is owned by, mostly by Huawei. Uh, Huawei has a lot of patents uh, that define the NBIoT standard. So um, you have uh, somehow some uh, uh, licenses, li licenses fees um, in, in the modules that impact uh, the final cost of the device. You have the cost of the spectrum, uh, and you know that spectrum is really expensive. It's multiple millions of dollars for a few, um, few hundreds of kilohertz. Um, and then uh, you have the legacy network. Um, NBIoT is using expensive LT base stations. And, and I said it costs over $10,000 each. You still have the SIM card complexity. As of today, uh, it's still uh, physical SIM cards, um, sometimes embedded ones, but you still have uh, physical SIM cards. That's an extra dollar basically in the bomb cost. And you still have a verbose protocol and signaling uh, because it inherits uh, from previous cellular protocols. However, uh, we think that um, M2M use cases, IoT use cases that require rich traffic demand uh, are a good fit for NBAUT. On the opposite side, Sigfox uh, is trying to connect the unconnected, is trying to make uh, new business cases fly. Uh, so we are, we are targeting uh, uh, use cases like pallet tracking, tire monitoring, forest fire detection, or smart buttons, just to give you a few examples. And this these use cases, they require uh, usually sub $5 uh, devices uh, to have a business case that fly. So NBIoT cannot reach this because of the, of the cost. Here is a small uh, cost analysis. You see that you have um, four, uh, four parts uh, defining the, the total cost of ownership. You have the device, you have the communication service, you have the IT integration, and then you have um, a, a final section, which I called cost avoidance. Uh, cost avoidance is basically um, all the provisioning processes that you have to do. It's, it's time, you, time and effort you spend uh, on this task. It's maintenance due to the replacement of the batteries. So um, if you use a, a technology that consumes less power, uh, you can save a lot more cost in this area. And that's why it matters in, in the calculation. So about device cost, you see that the radio module with Sigfox is at $2, while NBIoT, uh, it's estimated to uh, $10, $15. I've heard um, numbers slightly below, but it's often subsidized by mobile operators. Then you have uh, the extra dollar uh, caused by the SIM card. On the communication service, again, I write estimated because uh, there are not so many uh, live NBIoT networks yet, uh, but I expect them to be uh, very competitive uh, with Sigfox, so uh, targeting a, a similar kind of uh, uh, subscription uh, price. Then you have the IT integration cost. So Sigfox, you integrate once with the backend and all of the, all of the devices globally uh, are connected with NBIoT. If you are a global player, you will have to integrate with each and every mobile operator, and that impacts uh, the cost. One benefit of Sigfox, similarly to what I said uh, with Laura, is the battery life predictability of Sigfox. So NB-IoT is working uh, the same as Laura, depending on how far you are from the base station, uh, the power consumption differs. And uh, the battery life predictability is uh, essential uh, when you need to plan the maintenance or when you need to ad advertise the battery life to customers. So uh, let's imagine a consumer product. If you want to guarantee uh, one year of battery life, uh, you can do that with Sigfox. You cannot do that with LoRa or NBIoT. It will highly depend on where your customer is located. About power consumption, uh, so Sigfox, it's very simple to calculate. You just need to know the current of the, of the module you're using. Our best, best performing module uh, consumes around uh, 34 microampere hour uh, per message, and the lowest performing one around 85 microampere uh, 
microampere hour uh, for one message. Um, so that is the case for Sigfox. Um, if I compare with NB-IoT, uh, here we have bigger messages. We have 200 bytes, while Sigfox was 12. So we should we should do the calculation. Um, it's it's very competitive when the device is close to the base station. So you see coverage level zero or coverage level one. So it means uh, close by to the base station, 80 microamp per hour or 200 uh, microamp per hour. Uh, but you see, as you get far from the base station, you have a 10x difference with a device that is close by. So it was 80 microamp per hour here. It's 1000 microamp per hour uh, for a device that is at the edge of the network. So that uh, backs up what I was saying before that um, it's hard to advertise on the battery life of a device. Each technology has its merits. Um, I, I don't come back on the ones of uh, Sigfox. We, we've talked about this uh, earlier. Um, NB-IoT, its key attributes are that uh, it has reactive bidirectionality. Okay, so we can reach out to the device anytime um, while the downlink was initiated by the Sigfox device. Um, so it, it means that you can have downlink messages, but you have to somehow plan it in your firmware development. In your application, you have to have a, to trigger uh, the, the, the request for a downlink. With an NBIT, it's reactive. You have unlimited acknowledgement. Each message is acknowledged, and if not received, uh, retransmitted. The payload is larger. We said 200 bytes. Uh, the data limitation is lower because, because it's using the license spectrum, so there is no limitation or, or nearly, nearly not. Uh, you can do some firmware upgrades. 12 bytes, 12 bytes is a constraint for um, upgrading a firmware. 200 bytes is, is not. And then uh, the service lo level agreement is only um, locally. It depends on your operator. It's not global, meaning that uh, if you have an agreement with a local operator, when the device is roaming, uh, you don't have the priority anymore. So the quality of service can be impacted. It's the same uh, with uh, smartphones. Good applications for NBIoT are uh, smart city applications, access control, point of sales, because uh, these applications require a lot of uh, downlink messages. The smart city one uh, was more for, um, uh, I would say, uh, data limitation, uh, kind of reasons. Sigfox is limited to 140 messages per day and uh, for a, a parking application uh, downtown in the city you may need a message every five minutes so sometimes Sigfox technology is not uh, a good fit for that. And finally smart home and consumer. Um, the Sigfox network is targeting a lot. Uh, the B2B market, the enterprise market, um, we have we have some, uh, some contracts with operators uh, defining the, the population coverage, but we don't cover 100% of the territory. Uh, there is more chances that uh, mobile operators with deep pockets uh, may do. So that's why I put the smart home consumer on the side of NBIoT. It's not uh, strictly, strictly uh, divided like this, but um, I think it's going to be bigger uh, with this technology. And finally, LTEM, which is a, a higher end uh, technology, um, is better for mobility. So that, that's actually an important point. Uh, with NB, NBLT was not planned for mobility. So every time the device is, is uh, moving to a new cell, there is no handover. That's first. And, and second, uh, it has to restart the, the synchronization process, which is uh, very high consuming, very, very high power consuming. And LTEM was planned for mobility, so it's going to be the technology for the automotive uh, industry for connected cars. It's going to be the, the technology for health uh, and wearables. Um, so the good thing about LTEM, uh, unlike Sigfox, is that uh, you have um, servers in every country. Uh, linked to the operators, while in the case of Sigfox, you have a single cloud uh, in France. And that can be 
an issue with some uh, countries' regulations on health data. And finally, smart grid uh, re require low latency uh, protocols. So, uh, a quick summary: Why would you choose Sigfox over NBIoT? Uh, first, is uh, the return on investment uh, critical uh, for your use case? If yes, Sigfox is a cheaper technology than NBIoT. So that can be one of the reasons making you choose Sigfox over NBIoT. The second one can be uh, multi-country deployment. Uh, Sigfox is the first and only global IoT network. Um, others uh, are still far behind uh, to offer the same uh, service without roaming fees, um, ensuring, uh, ensuring uh, compatibility between the networks. Uh, do you need a, a long battery life uh, that can make you choose uh, Sigfox over NBIoT? We saw a few cases, mobility or when a device is at the edge of the network is challenging with NBIoT. Do you need to predict when to change and recharge your, your batteries? This is the case for uh, a use case like water metering. Okay, so um, that can make you choose Sigfox uh, over LoRa or NBIoT. And finally, do you need mobility for your device? And, and this is also uh, a good point uh, for Sigfox. Uh, Sigfox network is better for uh, mobile use cases than NBIoT, um, than NBIoT. Thank you very much for listening and I'm uh, ready for any question you, you have. Okay, so we had several questions. Um, first thing, uh, regarding uh, Laura, uh, Ali uh, gave some uh, details regarding the downlink. So I'm just reading them aloud. Maybe Maxim, you want to yeah. comment? Okay. So he was explaining that the downlink with Laura is three classes. So A, being uh, opening two reception windows after each transmission. B, being opening a reception yeah. window on predefined time intervals. And that's, C, that's, being, uh, that's right. having a continuously open reception windows, which in his opinion makes it uh, more efficient to interact with the device, especially in autom home automation, smart home solutions and utility. So that yeah, was uh, that, that, that the point. A, that's a correct comment. Actually, we are comparing uh, Sigfox with uh, LoRa Class A, which is the, uh, the longer range uh, protocol I mean, if we want to compare Apple to Apple, we, we have to uh, compare uh, LoRa Class A with Sigfox. And, and in that case, uh, there is downlink limitation due to the, the duty cycle uh, that, is, uh, that is pushed uh, in, in Europe. So that, that's, a, that's a fair comment, it's right. Um, we, we have to... Uh, we have to defer the, the short range uh, approach and the long range one. Um, and and Rael had another question. Uh, maybe it was answered uh, later on. So it was asking if to communicate between uh, different countries, uh, can he only use Sigfox or do we need a cellular communication such as NB-IoT? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully got the question. But the, definitely one of the unique selling point of Sigfox is that uh, we have a, a global network. We're in uh, 50 countries and we implemented a way uh, for, um, for devices to switch frequencies. So we are operating on four different bands, depending on the, the region where you are. And in a point of interest, like ports, airports, um, if you have the right library on your device, the device will understand that it moved to a different region and switch to that frequency. And, and so far, we are the only ones to, to have uh, that kind of algorithm and, and the ability to switch uh, in between uh, frequencies. Um, NBIoT can probably work uh, within a region, within nearby countries, if there is a roaming agreement between the mobile operators, which is not yet the case. But uh, yeah, in, in the near future, I'm sure you will, you will be able to do multi, uh, you will be able to roam uh, between uh, neighbor countries, but uh, with a, an extra cost. I hope that answers the, the question.
Yes, and Rel, feel free to comment uh, in the chat window if it doesn't, but uh, it sounds it does answer the question. Uh, and with uh, one last question from Gilda, asking about uh, what about the Things Network for multi-country deployment? Thank you. Okay, so the Things Network is a, a, a developer community. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the coverage is, um, how to say, spotty. You, you, have some, uh, you have some base stations here and there. Uh, it's not meant for uh, businesses to use. Uh, it's hard to predict where you, you're going to have coverage and, and where, where you won't. Um, the good thing with Sigfox is that uh, the operator is first deploying a, a nationwide network targeting uh, 80 to 90 percent of the population coverage and then um, businesses are, are able to rent base stations to customize their coverage so you can put a, a base station on top of the warehouse but it, it's still linked um, to the public network it's not your own for operating your own private network the the model of sigfox is a, a purely public network uh, so yes, there is this developer community, the Things Network. Uh, it's meant to be for hobbyists, for developers. You can benefit of the coverage of other developers, but I, I don't see businesses relying on that. So it's hard to, to compare the two. Uh, 